And next up, what I wanted to discuss was ARK Invest. Now, I will say, I think Cathy Wood is a genius from a marketing perspective. And I think the whole thing she set up and, and getting loud about Tesla and making those big calls and then everything came true and all of that, amazing. You know, I follow her. I like to see her make all those moves and that's all interesting. However, once again, I have a lot of quote unquote randos getting very loud about it and that's making me a bit scared. Now, that doesn't mean these people aren't very skilled, but they are lucky in a sense that they are in a great bull market right now where all tech went up. So like you could have tr made any ETF where you actively manage and you know threw some dart at some tech and you are up way high, not because you chose the best companies, but because tech as a whole has exploded. Now, I am I'm aware they have like a variety of ETFs. They have their innovation, innovation ETF. They have their space ETF. They have a bunch of these. Um, so, you know, it's not as simple. I'm, I'm painting with a broad brush here. But this reminds me a lot of Gerald Tsai, Manhattan Fund, Gary Pilgrim. Look up those terms if you're interested in that. Essentially, once in a while, you have some mutual fund, back in the day mutual fund, this is not a mutual fund. I actually had a commenter get mad that I said that, um, you know, there's always some hot mutual fund and then they said, oh, but ARK isn't a mutual fund. But yeah, but we, hadn't, we haven't really had anything like ARK before. So you can't have stories from the 1970s and so forth because it literally, like, that setup didn't exist yet. So anyway, you, you want to look at the hot mutual fronts from the 20th century or the early 2000s because um, those you, you can draw some really strong analogies. And so essentially, as you scale up, you know, let's say you are an investor and you, you do really well, which you could with a low capital, um, especially in, like, growth stocks in a very strong bull market, like, good on you, but you can with very low capital. The problem is, as you attract capital, it actually becomes extremely hard, like excruciatingly hard to keep outperforming that way. Uh, essentially, if you are nimble and your fund only has uh, some assets to work with, you are like a very quick spaceship and you can turn and swift and, oh, we're going to target this and now we're going to do this and now we're going to do this because you're lean and agile and quick. But... As you grow and you attract more capital, you become slower. You, you can't move all of that money into the big opportunities because you will bid up prices of things yourself. You know, the first dollar you spent on something slightly moves the price. But if you have to throw like a hundred million at something, you yourself are adding so much demand to that thing that you, you just become sluggish. And so that's an issue Warren Buffett, for example, has. You know, if you see an opportunity where you can turn 1 million into 3 million, you are a great fund manager and you might make a lot. But if you have billions under management, turning 1 into 3 million is nothing. You don't even notice that on your fucking graph, right? You know, once again, hyperbole. But so as this fund again, led by very smart people, grows bigger and attracts more capital, especially now that it's grown so much, I'm not so sure that she will keep on outperforming. And so once again, going kind of back to the rando theory, I'm getting so many people on Twitter and Facebook telling me like, this is the next big thing. Ha, huh, fuck you with your 7 to 10% a year in index funds. What an idiot you are. <laughs> I've got 100% right now. And like, great. Or usually they don't have 100%. Usually they're now buying the fund that just did 100% because they think it will keep doing 100%. And that is where I get... Oh, I, I don't know. And again, maybe she keeps on outperforming. Maybe she is the Peter Lynch of our time. It happens, but it is so rare. And once again, if you go back to the Gerald Tsai Manhattan Fund, you look at, at, at Pilgrim and so forth, like there are many, many examples in history where some fund manager outperformed everything so hard and then everyone pulls in their money thinking that they will get to capture these returns that no other magical fund manager can. And they, they say they have the golden touch. They've literally said this about these same people. And what happens is they no longer outperform. 
they very often crash and burn. Maybe they targeted an industry that got overinflated, you know, almost bubble-like. And while they may have chosen amazing companies and so forth, it's very possible that they are overpriced despite being amazing companies. And so that is very, very dangerous. Now, again, she might keep on outperforming. I don't know. I don't care. Well done if you keep on making money. That's amazing. And again, I'll keep on following her. It's very interesting stuff. I think she's a great marketer. I I guess she's been a great speculator slash investor as well. But I urge people to still be somewhat careful. You know, um, you are not all that diversified when you are putting all of your life savings into one single industry, even though that industry so far has outperformed everything. And if you were early to it, you know, you made bank. If you look at something like like some of these funds that I've mentioned before, let's say in 99, right, you invested into internet companies. Now, at that time, people said this is a paradigm shift. This is going to be a winner takes most industry. This is going to be the new thing, the next wave. You don't want to miss this. This is going to be the innovation, you guys. This is going to be it. You listened and those people were right. The internet was a paradigm shift. It did change the world and it was a winner takes most industry. And those companies did grow amazingly many years down the line. However, if you invested in internet in 99, you got destroyed despite the industry being huge because something can be overpriced and be an amazing company at the same time. If you bought Amazon in 99, I think it had a PE ratio of 2000, yeah? To give people who aren't, you know, very into this stuff, you know, a, a PE ratio in the S&P 500, when a stock is cheap, it would be like a PE of 12. When a stock is expensive, it would be a PE of 20, something like that, you know. Some people may say, oh no, it should be 26, wh whatever. You know, 12, cheap, 20, expensive. So Amazon had a PE of 2000, yeah? That is insane that is ludicrous and again this is the one company that won <laughs> for every one on amazon there's a thousand other companies that just crashed and burned so you already chose the one winner purely by accident but so for the many many years after that a full decade after that you saw no returns you lost almost everything in 2000 and 2001 and then you went on a very 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 long road of recovery assuming that you picked the one winner which was amazon because everything else not everything but most got destroyed and again you were investing in the future you were investing in the next big thing you were investing in the paradigm shift in the winner takes most industry and all of these beautiful beautiful buzzwords and you got destroyed. You had a decade of nothing. They call it the lost decade. So, you know, you can invest in a great company. Like, for example, Tesla. Once I know I'm burning a lot of bridges here. And again, I, I love Elon. I've been following Elon, I think, since Boy in a Band, which is a really interesting YouTuber. I made a video on him. I think that was like four years ago, maybe five years a long time ago, he made a video on that. So that was long before a lot of people were really even interested in Elon. I've been following him. I've been a fanboy. I, I love Teslas. I one day want to have a Tesla. I think SpaceX is amazing. All he does is amazing. He's a meme lord. He's amazing. But I do not invest in Tesla except for by holding an S&P 500 index, which, you know, automatically holds Tesla. But I don't specifically go after him. But when your PE ratio, which is your trailing PE, by the way, is over 1,200, that is more than Beaver Warriors attack points. That scares me. That, that gives me 99 shivers. And so once again, going back to the ran rando theory, um, I want to say a month or two ago, everyone was telling me, Tesla, you know, they just had these returns, so they're going to keep on doing that. We should all buy into Tesla. Since then, Tesla has done nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, again, great company and maybe long term they'll do great but i think before they keep on doing great they'll first do really really mediocre because again i think tesla will end up winning long term but that doesn't mean its stock price will keep on going up you can pay a lot for a stock of a company that's going to win where all the hype is already priced in again it might go up i don't know no one can predict the future but i'd be so cautious when, when your trailing PE is 1.2K or even more, 
something's up. Something's really, really up. That's also like a big portion of ARG's growth, by the way. Just the fact that Tesla boomed as much as Cathy said it would. So well done for her. But that's catching lightning in a bottle. And I don't know how many times you can do that in a row.